Hey everyone, Jason Fine, Director of Athletics at Bates College, here for Athletic Director U. I'm joined today by Director of Athletics at Morgan State, Ed Scott. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Associate Vice President and Director of Athletics at DePaul University, Stevie Baker Watson. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jay. Uh, today we're talking about work-life balance, something that is uh, near and dear to all of our hearts and something that we try to uh, instill in our staffs, especially with a small staff. Um, so we're going to jump right in and uh, college athletics obviously an industry where uh, we require a considerable amount of sweat equity uh, for smaller athletic departments and therefore smaller staffs. Uh, that statement probably couldn't be more true. Um, but beginning a career in this business on a small staff can really be an excellent way to see the bigger picture of how the business operates. So uh, is that a factor that you commonly use to attract administrative talent to your teams? Um, and what other attributes do you champion as special to a small staff setting? I think for me, what I try to do is be upfront with our staff when we're trying to hire them, that we are a family-friendly workplace. My goal is not just to have them in the business for a year, but really I want them in the business for 10, 20, 30 years. And so I need to have open communication so that way I can work for them. When I was getting through the business, I often traveled with my parents, I traveled with kids. So I have those real life stories to be able to share those with folks on my staff to say, listen, we can make this work and you can still be really successful at your job. I think for me it's essential at Morgan that's actually one of the things we promote when we hire people um, and I think some of that goes to my path as well when I was at Louisville I took a, a move to go to Binghamton and people were like why are you leaving the power five and I thought that it would give me a wider breadth of experience right so I would know more about athletics and so when you come work on a smaller staff you you can get lateral knowledge as opposed to just get siloed in a specific area of fundraising or academic advising and so it's actually something that we promote heavily and then what we also try to do is see what folks want to do with their careers and then try to formulate a plan that will allow them to grow that experience so by the time they do leave us they speak highly of us so we can hire behind them but also at the same time it prepares them for their next move. I think especially coaches and athletic administrators are not probably adept at asking for help and saying when there is kind of a problem there how do you identify professional fatigue within your staff and know when you need to kind of intervene because some may not come forth and be you know be telling you about it well when I when I hire everybody I ask them a series of questions and one of those questions is tell me what stresses you out what does it look like on you when you're stressed out? And how can I help you when you get stressed? And I remember those things. So some of it is that intuitive knowledge of being around your staff on a regular basis and figuring out when is it just a little bit too much. Um, most of us have played some other role other than athletic administrator, whether it's been a coach or sports information or athletic training. And so we know those ebbs and flows in terms of the years to be able to, to reach out and say proactively, hey, how can I help you? With this, the other thing is, is I find that because folks in athletics don't like to ask for help a whole lot, <laughs> I have to be really proactive and say to folks, I want you to take a vacation. This is going to be a slow time on campus. Everybody else is gonna be gone. Everybody else is on the road. Unless you absolutely have to be here, I want you away. I want you with your family. I want you with your friends type of thing. The other thing I do is I respect their boundaries when they do go out of the office. So if someone tells me they're on vacation, um, or they're taking time and they're working from home. I'm not calling them incessantly mm -hmm. trying to figure stuff out, right? You talked about training people laterally yeah. in the small space. That's another place where it helps out. When someone steps out, mm -hmm. other people fill the gaps for you. And then we learn how to accept that help from each other along the way. That's great. And, and it, remembering what they've told you back when you first hired them, that must be really positive for them to know that you care that way. I would hope so. I would hope so. And again, um, because I want folks to be in the business for two years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, I, I see that all as part of the natural progression, that we teach someone else how to employ mm -hmm. these great work-life integration tools and strategies, so they can go on to their next place and teach those strategies as well. Is it, is it uh, part of the learning process for you as you come on and you're kind of a new in a, in a place and you're kind of learning each other and then you're also trying to figure out how, how others are feeling about their stress level? I, I couldn't agree more. I think when you get somewhere, you got to assess that as soon as you can, right? When you bring in new people, sometimes it's a little bit easier because you can ask those questions. I think when you take over a staff, sometimes you have to ask the same questions, right? Because you're really interviewing them to understand where they are. I think the other thing, though, that you have to do is find the natural breakpoints, and that's really what Stevie was talking about, right? So 
we know in the winter, um, it's, it's going to be some downtime for your academic staff and those kind of people. So I look at cycles and try to see when we can cut the academic staff a little bit earlier. Uh, if we don't have a lot of students in winter classes, training staff is another one. So if you look at specific places within the athletic department, you're going to know where that work life balance or the overworking is really going to happen. And it's usually on the front lines. Um, the other thing, though, that I think Stevie brought up that's really important is that sometimes you have to tell your staff when they take vacation, and I have a staff member who will watch this and will be laughing about this, I'm sure. Um, when they take vacation, they need to unplug as well, right? Because sometimes folks will take a vacation, but they'll continue to work through it. And when they get back, their batteries aren't all the way recharged. And plus, you don't want people dependent on people when they're outside the office because it doesn't allow your organization to move forward the way you want to. So I think there's some, some balancing between, okay, when do we take these break points and then also making sure that when folks actually take a break that they do their best to unplug. Technology has made things so much easier, but it's also made it so hard to unplug, but you can do a lot of things, you know, away from the office. So, so along those lines, and working within the framework, you know, of an institution of higher learning overall is a reality of college athletics. But for some employees on a college campus, professors or even coaches, for example, um, in-office schedule flexibility is kind of an accepted practice. Um, how do you handle in-office hours for your staff, especially during busy times of the years when it's not, you know, down and we want you to take a vacation. It's when we have overlap of multiple sports seasons and things like that. How do you, how do you guys handle that? Well, for me, I uh, say to folks, I need you to be present when you're around. We work with student athletes and student athletes are around a lot, but they also need to set boundaries. So in general, I say to my folks, if you could be in by 930 and sort of at your desk till about 3.30, I think that's gonna work really well. If you wanna come in earlier because you get your best work done when it's quiet in the office, go ahead and do that. Sometimes it's easier to stick around later in the day, but again, it's about saying to folks, you have permission to work a flexible schedule in our space. We have so many folks who are on the phone at night recruiting, traveling on the road on the weekends, mm -hmm. um, that we have to, as supervisors, recognize that. And frankly, one of the things I found is that we have to almost defend that to other folks across campus mm -hmm. who see that flexible work environment as, well, you're not in the office as much as we are. Well, yeah, but we're working and we're producing. So part of that goes along with having really clear expectations of the coaches on our staff. So that way, from a performance perspective, I can clearly see where they're slipping and I can step in and ask how I might be able to help. Or I can say to them, you know what, this isn't working. I thought you coming in at midday a couple days a week was going to be great, but now I find that there's student athletes who can't, mm -hmm. who can't find you. But I think it's an evolution too. I don't think the things I did five years ago with my staff are the things that I'm doing with my staff today. I would hope not, right? Yeah. Well, adapting and changing, you know, I, I've often had this conversation with faculty, right? So your syllabus is not the same as it was when you started 30 years ago, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. So I think as coaches and administrators, you know, we probably have to do do the same thing. And you know, everyone has that administrator that loves to set those 8 a.m. meetings. And there's <laughs> not that rec right. recognition that we're going to be there until the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, yes. which you know nobody's going to show up and they're not going to be attentive and alert, right? right? So therefore, they're counterproductive. I would add to what Stevie said, sometimes you got to individualize, and I think that's a place she was going with it, um, because people have different life demands, family demands and those kind of things. So some people may want to come in at eight because they got to pick up their child at daycare at four so they don't incur additional expenses. And I think that's where knowing your staff and, and really being emotionally intelligent about what their needs are allows you to put them in a position to be successful. And I think we find as ADs and supervisors in general, when we do that, they actually work harder. Right. And so it's easy to assess their performance when when you're giving them what they need to be successful. And it's not necessarily about punching a clock. And, and then the other piece that I agree with is the educational component across campus. Right. You really have to let them know. And so one night, one of our B, uh, VPs had said, uh, hey, I saw you here last night at 1030 after the game. And then you were back on campus at 830 the next morning for a cabinet meeting. I said, yeah, that's what we have to do. And their mind was blown by that because they get to go home at five or six o'clock. They can continue to work from home and then, you know, come in at a regular hour. So I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure we educate them as to why we are flexible in our scheduling. And then it also allows us, I think, as athletic directors to advocate for them with those folks across campus when they see our staff there doing the work day in, day out, night in, night out. So.
Um, I think we spend the rest of our time kind of talking a little bit about this notion of work-life balance and can it really you know, exist in our industry? We talk a lot about it, but I think we're probably not all great at, at, at putting it into practice. So how often do you discuss that balance uh, with your team? You mentioned it a little bit about how you like to try to encourage them to get out of the office, but ultimately, how do you personally define work-life balance you know, in the context of this industry where we talk about it so much, but how do we actually get it into practice? <laughs> I'm gonna let you go first right, again right, right, on okay. that one. <laughs> so I think there was a time when folks said, I have a job, and then it turned into, I have a career. Mm -hmm. Now it's turned into, I have a lifestyle. Absolutely. And college athletics is a lifestyle, and there's ebbs and flows. There's really great highs and... Tough lows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that you've got to keep that all in perspective. Um, from the start, I got my, my background's in athletic training. My husband's a college football coach. Oh, look. It gets no better. <laughs> Our first child was born the end of September when oh. you're an athletic, when I'm an athletic trainer yes, for football and he's a football season. coach. So, I mean, I, I was living and breathing this and I found that one, I had to advocate for myself and I had to educate for myself. But that gave me the confidence then to have conversations with supervisors along the way. And I know not all, every one of my staff can do that. So I do try to have conversations with folks ahead of time mm -hmm. when I know life changes are coming. I'm very fortunate that my staff is very open with me when they are having personal struggles to let me know. So that way I can help maybe give them some cover perhaps on campus or in the department. But one of the things we started a few years ago is we actually have a work-life integration committee within athletics. Mm, I like that. And that was a number of coaches, uh, team sport individual, veterans and new folks that get together to help me keep a pulse on the department. Mm. Because I can, I can do a pretty good job, I think, but not everybody wants to tell their boss everything. Amen. And sometimes yeah. the things I think are really good, they think are really bad. <laughs> no. And so they're able to tell us, uh, how do we want to have more dialogues with each other? You know, do you need more notice when you're going out of town? How do we want to handle spouse partner travel for things? So they've been invaluable for me. I don't have to have all the answers. I just need to surround myself with really good people so that way they can help me make the best decisions. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, first coming up before I became an AD, I used to ask ADs that all the time. You know, what is your work-life balance? And I realized that there's no such thing, right? There's no easy way to define that. It's what works for you and your family. And so as, as Stevie was saying, um, we're about to have our first child in June, right? So my wife and I are having conversations about how we're going to manage it, right? And manage the process, obviously not the child, but the process. And the one thing that we talked about is it is a lifestyle for us, right? My wife was a dancer at University of Louisville, so she's traveled with teams. She understands what the lifestyle is like. And so we've talked about integrating our daughter into the process, right? So, so that way we do it as a family. And I think sometimes you can do that for your staff. So one of the things we started with football this year is having a family day and so on an away trip we would take the spouse and the children not a far trip where we could bus or we're chartering so we don't have to pay for additional uh, transportation but the morale and what it does for those families and they get to see what their husbands are doing on the road um, and it's just it's been an actual you know a great tremendous asset for us where folks look forward to it and so I think there's creative things that you can do but I don't think there's one right answer and again managing your staff their needs are different and so some Sometimes you have to tell them that I think you're a little bit out of balance right now. And so how do we help you get back to that? Because ultimately, if you want them to perform at their best, then they need to be in a good place. That, that's a great point. I mean, sometimes the toughest thing is admitting that you need that little help. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you're going to have a child. So I'm sure, you know, doing, the, doing that work at 3 a.m. is not going to be a hassle. You just do email with one hand and take care of the well, I don't want to tell you about, you know, my next six months. I'm in the process of finishing my Ph.D. right now. I should defend in March or April. And then uh, Tia, our child, will be born in June. And um, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to handle all that. But it's a really exciting phase. And to be where I'm at in life, I, I look forward to it. And so what I did, though, honestly, I went to my president and said, look, you have a son, you have been a president for a while, you've been a VP, tell me some things that you did well and some things that if you had to do them over again, you might do differently. And we spent a good hour um, and he talked me through some things and one of the things he said to me, which I really appreciated, it shows alignment in our organization, uh, he said, you need to take some paternity leave and I'm going to make sure you do that because I want you to be present. And that, to me, spoke volumes about my president, about his leadership style, which also allows me to emulate that with my staff. I think when it starts from the top like that and, and everyone's invested in everyone's success along the way, it makes it a lot easier. So if you could, if you could give some advice to some, some new ADs here just about how to manage their own 
work-life balance and, uh, and, and do that within their staff, what would be a few, few words that you tell them? <laughs> wow, I think you need to be honest with yourself first. Uh, we have this superhero mentality sometimes that we can do everything because we are pretty good, yes. right? Yeah. We are pretty good. We surround ourselves with good people, but um, eventually we tire out. So you have to have this realization of when is, when is it too much and recognize and then act on those signs. Um, I think for me, it's about a journey. The needs that you'll have in your family, having an infant will change when they become a toddler and then they become grade school. Um, it is the best place to raise a, college, a kid, I think, is on a college campus, Darn. to be quite honest with you. And so things will evolve and change over time and you just, you need to be patient for that. So it's, it's a lot of, I think, inner peace kind of component as you work through this because it is going to be different. Every institution you go to Absolutely. with every supervisor is going to create this new sort of puzzle for you to try to figure out what's the best way for me to have a life. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, go about kind of expecting the unexpected, right? So you go, we all have these days, you go in, you have, you have meetings, you have things that you plan on doing and you get that, you know, left turn, right turn. So usually at the expense of our health, right? There goes my workout, <laughs> there goes my lunch. How do you, you know, anticipate the unexpected and still have some semblance of a life? Well, I, I would say two things. One, I tell anyone who wants to be an AD, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? Because you don't know what's coming at you, where it's coming from. And so you got to be able to pivot and be agile like an athlete. The other thing I tell folks is to make sure that if you want to be an AD, that you want to do the job of an AD. A lot of folks say, I want to be an AD. Until you sit in a chair and you actually know what goes on because you don't always have all the information even as a deputy or number two, uh, I think it's really important that folks really want to do the job because it's not all pretty, right? There's a lot of HR, a lot of legal, a lot of stuff behind the scenes and they think that yes, you're doing press conferences and you're in front of the media. That is such a small portion of what we do on a daily basis. And so the advice that I try to give folks is make sure that's something you really want to do. Um, because it's a little too late to figure that out when you get in the chair. That's a great point. And usually, you know, the first time your, your associate or your deputy goes and gets that job and they come back and the first thing they said is, oh, okay, now I, now I see what you meant. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, thank you uh, very much for joining us. Um, we've been joined by Ed Scott, the Director of Athletics at Morgan State, and Stevie Baker Watson, the Associate Vice President and Director of Athletics at DePaul University. I'm Jason Fine, the Director of Athletics at Bates College here for Athletic Director University. Thanks a lot for joining us.